friends. Hi. <laughs> Welcome to another episode of Conversations With. This time we are here with our friend and colleague and respected faculty, full-time faculty here at SRJC, Dr. Ian Libby. Thanks for being here. Yes, welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm really thrilled to be here today. Thank you. And I feel so lucky because in one of our scholarship committee meetings, you're part of the scholarship committee. Uh, we were uh, last fall talking about the housing plans that are coming here on campus and how excited we are. And being that uh, we are so lucky with our Doyle program and the robust funding that's available, we were working on how we could get Doyle funds to help support our housing students. And Dr. L Livy, you had such a cool story to share uh, with the group. And I'm so excited that we get to share it today with, with more of our community. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, in addition to teaching history at SRJC, I'm also an alum. Um, I finished, I went from 95 to 97. 1995 to 97 i want to be really clear I, mean, I look really good for like over like 200 years old um so it, the story is this um i have an identical twin brother and my my i'm a first generation college student um my brother and i are were um pretty successful in high school we were trying really hard i think mostly it came from a conversation which a lot of the story i'm going to tell today happens in one room in our house which my parents still live in, which is the kitchen. It's where a lot of converse, family conversations happen yeah. in that space at the kitchen table. And I remember it like I was yesterday. I was struggling in eighth grade in math. I was not having it. I was not doing well. And my dad, who was a at that point an out of work um, union sprinkler fitter, he's just sat us down and he's like, you have to get an education. You have to. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, to have choice, to have, to have the choice, oh, excuse me, okay. to have the choice that I didn't have. And for whatever reason, teenage me and like clicked, like I need to do, I need to do better, I need to hustle. And so uh, I think my brother was already at that point and past it. He was like probably a little bit in, more intellectually mature at that point and he was doing better. And I was like, shoot, I have to, I have to try, I have to try harder. Um, and I, I watched what, you know, the, the fact that my dad had lack of choices, what it had done to, to our situation financially and every other way. So from then on, I tried really hard most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> like most of the time, I also had a lot of fun. Um, and we get to the point where we're applying for college at that kitchen table and my brother and I were really excited. We were looking at, you know, UC Berkeley, UC Davis. I was really excited about maybe going to Santa Cruz. Like, I was like, oh, that's a really cool place. And it's far enough away where they can't find me. And like, um, all of those things you think of as a teenager. And, um, you know, my parents were really supportive and they supported us through the entire process, but they knew something that, you know, we didn't know. They were really hoping for some sort of miracle in terms of financing because we didn't have very much money. And so my mom was uh, worked for Petaluma City Schools and was um, she was a, a human resources clerk. And, you know, my dad at that point was the school district plumber, which is rough, by the way, if your dad is the plumber for the school district, because yeah. he will show up at your high school and embarrass you. Yeah. Um, but like, that was cool too. Yeah. Um, but so we applied and we, we did what we did. And we also, you know, we were well aware that we needed, you know, other plans just in case. And so we were, you know, part of the Doyle process as well. And so we had this conversation when we were getting our acceptance letters and, and rejection letters too. And it was basically my parents sitting us down at that table and saying, we can't afford to send you both. And because it wasn't gonna be covered all the way and with housing and everything else. And this was in the nineties when it was far less expensive than today, far less capital intensive than today. And so my brother and I, we kind of decided we'll just, we'll, we'll take advantage of this thing that will allow us to go to, to college, the Doyle Scholarship. I am not here today. I'm not the person I am today without Doyle. Um, all of our, you know, uh, all of our, you know, very fortunate circumstances that I live, you know, uh, here in Petaluma, I get to teach at a wonderful institution. I get to um, be engaged in my profession. All of those things started with that. 
And so it, for, for both me and my brother, it was a godsend. It was absolutely the right thing at the right time. It paid for everything for us. Um, and occasionally, I think there was one or two semesters where I had like a couple bucks left over, which was awesome. Um, I still worked pr mostly full time during that time as a, in a movie theater here in Petaluma, wow. um, because I was trying to save up to make sure the second two years were a little more smooth because you don't know what's coming after, after you leave. And um, it really got us through undergraduate work, which I think is spectacular. And the same goes for my wife. Uh, my wife is, um, far more successful than I am. She's um, also a Doyle Scholar. She was an SA SRJC grad. She's currently the director of the Marin County Library System. Like, so amazing. Kind, of, kind of an amazing person. And she has similar circumstances, single family, single parent family, really kind of low means to go. Doyle Scholar gets her through, allows her to transfer to UC Santa Cruz. I didn't know her back then, by the way. She wouldn't have wanted anything to do with me, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> she claims that, like, I probably would have talked to you. I'm like, that's a really low bar. <laughs> Anyways, like, she, her success starts with that. Like, it starts with that too. And like, remember, you know, I, I think for us, we're both very fortunate in that we had that first starting point. Um, yeah. For me, the rest of the story of fina financing financial aid for me is more is more right. It's more challenging because it involved, particularly for my graduate work, loans yeah. um, <laughs> and extensive loans, um, which I think were worth it. And at the same time, I think the last 12, 13 years, 13 years since I finished my PhD, 13 years. The, the over, hanging over my head certainly and, and, and my family's head now, it was call it student loan debt. Um, I was very fortunate in November, however, to get my loans forgiven um, through the public service loan forgiveness program. Oh, that's which, awesome. I hear that. I, I'm not sure I can c convey the feeling that I felt getting that letter. Not knowing it was coming either, because like it was so shaky, right? I know. Yeah. It was crazy right at the end, and then like doing this crazy dance in front of my um, little kids, and they didn't Aww. understand what I was doing, and I was like so excited. And my wife recently had hers forgiven as well, and hers were not as extensive as mine, but they were there, and they had a huge impact on every plan we made, every decision we made, hinged on. But we also have this payment for something that we did a long time ago that was valuable and worth it. Sure. But we had to be cognizant of the fact that we couldn't make fancy plans for a particular moment or, you know, get married at the Vatican or something. I don't, I don't know. I mean, I'm trying the to make sacrifices. It yeah. Yeah. yeah, the sacrifices. Yeah, the sacrifices you have to make to be realistic. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And yet I feel so fortunate to have had access to those funds. We have a system that requires us to pay for higher education. And I was, I, I did get a really nice package for my, for my PhD program, and it was nowhere near enough to survive. It was nowhere near enough to do my research in London. It was nowhere near enough to take care of all of the things, I mean, living in a major metropolitan area, dealing with all of the day-to-days. I was working on the side. My first community college job was back in 2004 at LA Valley College teaching as an adjunct. And it still wasn't enough. And I needed to, I needed those loans to pay for all of the things that needed to be paid for. And I was fortunate that I was eligible for them and it really helped me. And I also had to pick, like, there was also the back end of that, you have to pay. Yeah. Me, so. Well, I mean, what an, I mean, I just feel so inspired. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> I know. As a re like right now, every time I hear certain stories, because I'm a returning student too, and I'm always like, I'm gonna make it somehow. <laughs> you you are, and yeah. I mean, I think that for me, like, there were moments in on every step where I'm like, it would be so much easier to stop. Yeah. It would be yeah. so much easier to just. It's gonna be so ex like the the cost financial, the cost in terms of your life, the sacrifices you're making, and yet. I feel so fortunate that I persisted in those moments and I had really bumpy times, especially yeah. in school. Like, you, you know, it's real, it's really challenging. And there's there's a lot of emotional weight that goes to being in school. It mm -hmm. takes you out of the loop of a lot of other things. I had friends who were well into their professional lives, making lots of 
money or compared to me, they were making lots of money. Okay. And I felt like, what am I doing? I'm not saving yeah. for retirement right now. I'm like, you know, mm-hmm. it was very, it was a, it was a risky thing. And I think that um, I wouldn't change it for the world. And I think one of the things that I like, that I talked to with my, you know, with my students, particularly the ones who are struggling with the weight of the choice to c- continue to push on is like, you don't know what's ahead of you, but what you do know is that th- where you are now can help you get there, help you get yeah. to where you want to be, help you to, to empower you to have choices. And that's why I encourage my students to please apply for every single possible Scott, like just do it, put yourself out there. It's yeah. one of the things I truly regret is that I'm, I have a really hard time asking for help. It's one of my real weaknesses. I still do. I'm that guy who won't ask someone for help and then fail at something repeatedly. But it, it, it's, it, it, it's especially when it comes to money, I will not ask people for help. And it's, it is not, it was not, a, it did not help me in certain moments. I was very fortunate at SRJC and in other places that I found myself to have people who could understand that I wasn't going to ask and who told, kind of beat me up about it a little bit. It's like, you got to tell people what you need. Yes. You have to be, you have to self-advocate as mm-hmm. we say in the education business. So, yeah. Um, so yes, absolutely. I believe in you. I don't know you very well. And I believe- <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. No. Yeah. Um, it's very inspiring. And especially, you know, I think the way that you even describe the moment in the, you know, I, I, feel very similar with that me and my parents have a lot of our conversations at the kitchen table too but it's just the fact that you know being a teenager when people can tell you one thing and it goes in one ear and it goes out the other but the fact that that moment really got real for you when you had that conversation with your with your dad I just think that's that's amazing and it's and there were many conversations with my dad where everything just I just like ignore it because you're a teenager and you ignore it. Yeah. But there was something about the, the and I still feel it, even remembering yeah. why I broke up a little bit there. Like this was this moment where he was like, I'm here to tell you whatever you think you know, you don't know, but I'm not I'm not trying to scare you. I'm trying to tell you, don't do what I did. Like don't make some of the choices he made. And like yeah. a lot of his life story has to do with the circumstances he found himself in as a teenager in the sixties. And mm-hmm. very different story. And yeah. he had a lot of different challenges that he faced. But he said, boy, you know, it's like, there's nothing more expensive than regret. Like oh. that you can't redo it. You can't find yourself, you know, you're not gonna be 18 for the rest of your life or whatever. Uh, you're gonna be wow. At that age for the rest of your life. And um, there, are, I think that for me, that moment is the thing that always, like I would come back to it. Like, this is why I have to keep pushing. Or this is why I have to make a, a like I have to be thoughtful about the decisions that, decisions I make to give myself choices to give myself options, and I find myself now in this really idyllic situation for the most part. I mean, nothing's ever perfect. Yeah, but um, hard to be here. yeah, I have um, a wonderful life. Um, I have an amazing job with students who I, like challenge me every day to be better. And I'm, I have to live up to that every day. And that's what drives me is to get better, to get better and to be a better um, instructor and advocate and to better understand where they're coming from and to better improve my approach to um, being a teacher and being an instructor. Um, I've got um, an amazing wife who um, challenges me every day to be better <laughs> as, as any spouse should. And I've got two unbelievable two-year-olds i have a twin two-year-olds a boy and a girl um, who are it's why i look like a little haggard <laughs> oh, <stop. laughs> no, no no slight to them but every morning is like a battle like today my i don't know if this is going to make the final cut but my son did not want to wear a shirt <laughs> <laughs> and it's like we got to go to daycare son you gotta wear a shirt <laughs> and he's like no, no. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I know that you're trying to show off, but not today. <laughs> Save it for the weekend. Let's put on a shirt. So I I feel like, you know, I feel like unbelievably fortunate. And not everyone is unbelievably fortunate. So I'm super thankful 
for the opportunities that I had. And my job and what I am pr most proud of in my time as a teacher, whether it's my 10 years plus as a high school teacher and coach, or my time now as a community college instructor is to make sure that I do right by the people who are entrusted to me and do my absolute best to provide the same types of experiences and opportunities that motivated me to go further and push myself, make trying fun, you know, like do all of the things that I can do and be sensitive to the fact that there are, there are stories that my students have, there are experiences they have that I need to understand and I need to modify how I approach my my instruction to better serve them um, without without changing the nature of what we're entrusted to do and, and holding students accountable. So I think there's an ethos, a former colleague of mine, um, Brian Ledyard, who I got to teach with and coach with, and we ran a summer program together for the high school that we worked at. He said, um, he used to say all the time to the kids we were coaching, we coached a basketball team one year, so JV boys basketball, we won one game. We were really bad, <laughs> really bad. And it was, they were, they were the, they're still like the center of my heart in a lot of ways because they had, we had a blast, but it was like rough, like definitely results yeah. wise, we were not, we weren't, as, as I would occasionally say, we're not going to state this year, kids. <laughs> like, we, need to, we need to work hard. Um, <laughs> He would tell the kids before we leave, take care of the people who take care of you. And yeah. it's something that informs everything that I do because the people who take care of me are the students at SRJC. SRJC belongs to them, not to me, not to anyone who works there, although we're all really important in that story. SRJC belongs to its students. Every educational institution belongs to its students. And our job as stewards is to make sure that we take care of them, whether it's providing them opportunities to further their education through yeah. um, f f like a really robust financial aid program, um, whether it's providing resources for students who have learning differences to to excel, to meet and excel, um, uh, meet their needs and excel in the courses that they take, um, whether it's through our counseling program, the transfer of counselors, I got an opportunity to um, do something with them at the last PDA day. And it's just like unbelievable what they do to master all of that information and to provide these very personalized journeys for students to find fit, not to find the best college on earth or the whatever, it's to find the best one for them, for them, who they are, what they need. So I, I think we, I just cannot say enough about our community and our, what we do. And we also have always have room for improvement, but I feel it's my job to take care of the people who take care of me and that's the students. And so it means that when there's a message about scholarship applications are due, the first thing and the last thing I say on that day in class is, hey, <laughs> free money. Yeah. <laughs> you probably, you should probably get some and maybe cut me in. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it's a way to encourage them to do it. <laughs> yeah. um, but in all seriousness, I think that that is where we as a community have to continue to excel. We have to continue to take care of these people yeah. and model that for the rest of our community, our larger community, um, because we, I think, struggle at that at times, taking care of our community. So. Absolutely. Oh. Well, we are so lucky that, that you get to, you know, um, I, I mean, it's, it's, it's clear and it's obvious that you have a great impact on our community. And um, it's just, I feel so lucky to get to know you better and yeah. get to feel uh, your profound belief in our, in what we do as an institution. And, and you're right, there is always room for improvement and that's what helps us keep things fresh and evolving and always working toward the greater good. And I'm so privileged to learn more of, your, of who you are and yeah. how you're supporting our community. And I, I join you in that. And I know that, that um, our department who is always trying to evolve and better serve our students, we, we join you in that effort fully that means a lot. And I know, I mean, that's one of the reasons why I was, you know, I was an instructor. I was a tenure track professor at another community college. Um, admittedly, the commute was brutal. It was to Sacramento and back. 
every day, which is admittedly, it was rough. It was rough. Yeah. <laughs> My back was like this, <laughs> like it was terrible <laughs> from the drive. It was just like, yeah. and it's a, it was a, it's a rough drive. People on 80 are not, they're not nice. <laughs> They're not <laughs> nice. <laughs> and I love my call. I still do. I still love the people that I got to work with there. I love the community. Um, it was a great opportunity. It was just for one year. Um, and I saw myself staying there. And then there was this this job listing popped up. And I've been an adjunct um, and associate faculty member at SRJC for a number of years on the side. And I was like, oh my God, I can, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna go for this. And I had this like very emotional cathartic moment. Like I have to go for this. I have to yeah. do it. And we found out we were pregnant. I was interviewing for this job and got the job. Like all happened within like a month and a half. And my wife was also in the process of getting a deal. And so like, it was this really like whirlwind few months. Yeah. And you know, you're constantly thinking about, wow, this is gonna be, this is going to be, a, this is like a dream come true. I mean, when I was at the JC, it was like, wouldn't it be cool to teach here? Wow. Wouldn't it be cool to teach? Because I always knew I wanted to teach. That was yeah. never in question. It was just like, wouldn't it be cool to teach here? Like full time, like this would be my job. And then it happened. And then and it, it happened. happened. That's so awesome. And it's like, I, I feel lucky. I don't know how it happened. And it was all during COVID. So all of my interviews were like this, which uh, was weird. <laughs> <laughs> Because you're like in a suit, and then you're like, yeah. did I wear the shoes? <laughs> <It's all laughs> right? Yeah. I guess Is it I'm necessary? Gonna, it's kind of weird, but I'm going to wear them just so I Yeah, just so you feel like it's official. <laughs> yeah, yes. but it was, it was, um, I think that's, you know, I don't forget how lucky I am. I, you know, there are little things you can quibble. Like, there are things that frustrate me, and, and I wish were better, and I work on those in the capacity that I can, including with the things that I do. Like, there are things that I'm like, boy, I wish I had done that better. That was a mistake. I wish I had done that. And it usually happens at least once or twice a day when I'm teaching. I'm like, I missed an opportunity there. And but that's, re but reflection is what helps you to continue to grow. Yeah. And I think that's like one of, that's a very poignant part of our ability, like our chance to learn about you today is that you're not afraid of that. And it, yeah, I feel like that's a, for me, it's the most important quality of being a good colleague is knowing that you're not done. Yeah. You're never done. Yeah. And it's it's also like at a time, there are times where like boy I'd love to coast <laughs> like I really want to coast and it's certainly yeah. April like April in the spring semester you can feel it with the students too everyone's like yeah. pumping the brakes a little bit and like, yeah. you're like I could do that too and like maybe I, you know like wouldn't it be cool if I just like yeah. you know maybe today's movie day. <laughs> no but like yeah. in all seriousness like you you also like feel like no I have to do it I'd feel horrible if I did if I went down that road and like. Yeah. I'm so lucky that I have like the colleagues that I get to work with are I think in the same spirit like working to improve working to be better because you're doing the same things you did five years ago you you aren't learning right and if you're yeah. not learning from your students then they're not learning from you there that is a relationship issue that's yeah. an issue that you're not producing uh that really solid relationship and ultimately what teaching is is relationship building it's about creating community so um absolutely uh 100 like it's it's daunting sometimes it's frustrating it's like sometimes you just want to like phone it in because that's life and you're yeah. tired but that's also our students aren't you know we expect our students to not phone it in that's right. so why would yeah. we yeah. exactly yeah. yeah we've all made commitments whether it's to our coursework mm -hmm. or our careers and yeah. our duty, you know, that, that we have committed to caring for our students and our community. Thank you for that really beautiful reminder yeah. and for keeping keeping things fresh. I, I'm thrilled and um, let's do this again. Yeah, yes. absolutely. <laughs> see you tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'll do it soon. Absolutely. Um, absolutely. So I'll just, you know, we'll just kind of put out a message there reminding our, our friends and students in the community that it's never too late to apply for financial aid. We are we are here in the summertime. I think yes. sometimes people think that, you know, maybe if they're not taking a class in the summer that the campus kind of shuts down, but we are bang, We're bang, still bang. working, <laughs> yes. Yeah. We are here Monday through Thursdays during the summer. So we're still available, so we always want to be like, if you have any questions, always call us and we'll help anybody who needs any help, even with the slightest question.
and I can say with some certainty, if you're unsure, if you know that you need help, it never hurts to ask. And this is the hardest thing for me to say because I'm horrible at it, but it never hurts to make that phone call or to just to, to take advantage of the services you're providing in the summer to be able to come in and just say, I don't know how I'm going to make this happen. Yep. I don't know. I am looking at the future and I don't know how I want to make, how I'm going to make this work. Yep. And it's so reassuring to know that, that you folks are there to provide that support. Um, it's something that we can sometimes in the classroom, we lose track of the fact that for every time our students are in the classroom, they're not able to be at the job that they're like, they likely have. Right. Right. They're not able to take, if they have children, to be able to provide childcare, something that has become more acutely poignant to me over the last two years. Um, as I've, we've struggled with stability in childcare, um, and it's really hard. We lost childcare for a bit in the fall for about a month. And it was, it was, it was fun, <laughs> but and I have fond memories of some of it, but it was really hard. It was yeah. really hard to meet the needs of our, like my students for my wife, like we had to trade off and like, you know, there was a lot of like, wait, hoping that they would go to their nap on time. Yeah. <laughs> so like a big phone call. You cannot <laughs> like, please go to sleep. I know, exactly, yeah. But our, our students have children, they have families, they have these obligations right. and to recognize that when they're here with us, that means they're not in another place where they could be meeting those needs. And so we have, it's reassuring to know that there's, there are resources available yeah. to help students to persist, to make that next, to take that next step, to get ready for whatever it is they're, they're studying for, whether it's a terminal degree at SRJC or transfer, which is also scary and daunting. And like, how are you going to do this? And for you to be there for them, it means the world to everyone who's in the classroom, to everyone who works in whatever capacity on campus. Totally. That is, yeah. it, it's spectacular. Thank you. Thank you. Well, cheers to that. And uh, I, again, look forward to next time. Yeah. Yes. Dr. Awesome. Olivia, thank, thank you so you. much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. It's very nice to get a chance to chat and to, to meet you. And it was good to meet you, we went through the screen. Yeah, virtually meet you. <laughs> yeah. If you see me on campus, we yes. often say hello. I Usually will. I'm like, oh. oh. <laughs> it's cold or oh, it's too hot. <laughs> Do we need to ask, are you wearing shoes? I'm not wearing shoes right oh, now. Oh, here we go. <laughs> Is this being recorded? <laughs> yeah. I was actually literally, like I have one of my daughter's hair ties. I was literally finding these all over the carpet and like collecting them uh, <laughs> because the vacuum cleaner doesn't like them. And there you go. And so I had one on my finger for like half of this thing. But I'm like, gonna stop recording. I didn't stop. Yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay.